The Middle Belt Forum has said President Muhammad Buhari has failed woefully to deliver his promise to completely eliminate Boko Haram in the country. They noted that the president, rather than fulfilling his promise, two Nigerians watched helplessly while the insurgents spread from the northeast to all parts of the country. Meanwhile, the president has replied to the accusations over the worsening security situation, saying that he has fulfilled his promises to Nigerians on tackling Boko Haram, insurgency, reviving the economy, and fighting corruption. Well, joining us to discuss this is George Ashiru. He is the ADC uh, Lagos State Chairman. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Ashiru. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be online with you tonight. Great. Your candidate uh, for the position of president is also, of course, running against the candidate of the APC. And if anything that the president has said um, in, the, in, in, in light of you know, this conversation is something to go by, um, then maybe we don't have a conversation to have this night. Or is the president saying something that is not true? Uh, well, essentially, uh, the party in power or the leader that is in power in government has a duty to defend its reputation and defend its policies. And uh, But we, the, the, the electorate and the opposition, it's our duty to also bring forth why we believe that uh, there's a, that, you know, you can do better. So uh, I think one of the hallmarks of good leadership is to accept a positive criticism and to uh, acknowledge and review the issues that are related to that criticism in view of correcting them rather than simply sweeping them under the carpet. So it's very clear to everybody that there isn't uh, enough peace in, in, the, in certain regions of Nigeria, uh, apart from the incessant attacks of the militants. We also have the uh, non-going kidnappings and, and other violences, including now political violence. And we may not have enough resources to tackle them. There's nothing wrong with the government simply telling us we're doing our best, we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough boots on ground, enough manpower, enough equipment, enough intelligence, and then, you know, let the National Assembly begin to vote, you know, to increase the resources. Uh, but it's better than to simply say, oh, everything is all right, and, you know, we're, we're good to go. But do you, do, you, do you not believe that maybe this is what the president believes is the situation? Because half the time when, I mean, I remember from in January 2022, we, we started off the year with massacres, with killings, you know, in different parts of the country. And I mean, the whole of 2022, if you look at all the events that happened, 80% of them um, were, you know, insecurity related issues. So... Uh, but every time Mr. President reacted to this, he always said he was shocked, he was surprised. So could it be that Mr. President believes or has been made to believe that insecurity is a thing of the past in this country and that we're not facing economic issues, neither uh, are we facing uh, you know, underemployment or unemployment? Well, the, the, the truth about it is that, again, like I said, um, the government will defend itself uh, every time. Uh, even with the elephant in the room, there will still be uh, a robust defense of the policies because politically it's a cost to accept that you have failed in any area that that gives, um, that gives a weapon to the opposition to, uh, to campaign against the government. Um, on the other hand, we can also say the integrity of the president is the reason we believe that the president would not, uh, would not lie when he says, in his own opinion, everything is going, uh, you know, honky-dory. And I think essentially um, uh, it is the briefing that the president gets that he's going to base his opinions on. So if all he gets is we're winning, we're doing well, uh, you, if you give us one trillion naira, we, we're wiping out so many thousands of uh, insurgents every second. As long as that's the, that's the briefing that the president gets for the security briefing, that's what he's going to present to the electorate. But, you know, we are on the ground and the people in the affected regions will be the testament of the testimony of the effect effectiveness of these uh, security operations. And perhaps this is the reason why uh, good leaders have town hall meetings. You know, you go to the communities affected, you listen to them. And when you listen to them, it, it informs your judgment and then informs uh, your actions as a leader. 
What does this say about the leadership style of Mr. President? Um, ne let's not also forget that when once the president became our president, sworn into office, it took a long time for us to be able to even get him to speak to us as a people. And it's always been one person speaking and the other one coming to debunk this and that. Um, in, in looking back at the Buhari administration from 2015, um, what can we say about his leadership style? For a person who tried to run for this office four times and finally got in, can we really say that it was a chance that was well um, utilized? Well, I think the president himself has spoken in, you know, in time past, when he first uh, became president, that uh, why did Nigerians choose to make him president at his advanced age? which means the kind of dynamism and energy and quickness of action and reaction and thought that you will associate with a younger candidate. Um, he, 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 had, he had gone past his prime in that regard. So he would have to allow, basically delegate a lot of things because of his advanced age. He would have to delegate. But he, he didn't have, a choice, now. Not to, he he didn't have a choice not to run. He, you could know, have, he could have decided not to run, knowing that he's too old for, to run or he's not energetic, as well, he said. Well, well, he could well, have chosen not to. Sometimes you run for office because it is required of you by the people. It's not always a matter of I. Not all politicians are personally ambitious. They serve because the people believe that their leadership or style or their integrity is required. Don't forget the reason that uh, people decided to vote for the president uh, the first time around was because they felt that corruption had reached a level and they were holding on to his former reputation as a military head of state that he would be able to curb it. So at that time, that was the kind of leadership required. Uh, whether or not it was um, efficiently used and that integrity was sufficient and the difference between political leadership and military leadership, all of them have obviously have come to play. And uh, the result is what we see today. Let's break some things down. Let's go back to the three things, the three um, pillars through which Mr. President came into office, most importantly in security, um, fighting insurgency, building the economy, and of course, fighting corruption. But I want to start with um, building the economy. Let's look at the economy right now. Even though uh, the whole world in 2020 shut down and then most countries are still dealing with post-COVID, but before COVID and now and where we are today, how well has the, the Buhari administration dealt with our economy? Looking at all of the issues relating to um, banking, agriculture, um, small-scale loans, and all kinds of things. Um, how well have we done, especially also with the CBN governor taking on responsibilities of the Minister of Agriculture, et cetera, et cetera? Can we give a pass mark in that regard? Uh, well, no, of course not. I mean, uh, the economy of the country since 1999 has shrunk. The GDP of the country has shrunk from uh, its peak sometime in 20, uh, between 20. 10 and 2014, our economy peaked. Our GDP was over 500 billion US dollars, and now it's just barely over 400 billion US dollars. And so, definitely, our, our economy has shrunk by about 20 percent, and that's a huge shrink of any economy. And the exchange rate has, has multiplied by a factor of about two, three hundred percent. Again, that makes inflation extremely difficult to manage because we are in an import dependent economy, and our sole export critical export, uh, which is what funds the government, is crude oil. And even the, even the crude oil, we are not able to export all that we can produce. We can produce over 2 million barrels a day. We are not able to even export most of them because of oil theft and bunkering and all that. So, uh, I mean, it's all eyes, eyes can see. These are the things that they call the, the disease of the eyes. So, clearly, the economy has not done well. It's not been well managed. The, the, the ways to, to stabilize it has been, let's inject more funds into the economy, let's give out more contracts, let's focus on infrastructure. Like Lagos State is spending 60, almost 60%, if not more, of its entire 2022 budget, 2022 budget on infrastructure. It will hope that when you flood the markets, then it will encourage buying and the economy will float. But the, the Human Development Index for each individual shows that poverty is still rising. And so clearly... Some of these policies are not influencing and affecting the lives of individuals. And you can see the effect of this in the Japa syndrome, uh, uh, terrible inflation. Now, people will say that post-COVID, world economy has been in a meltdown. Post-COVID, uh, you know, the inflation has risen. Post-COVID, oh, there's, there's always something to blame. But other countries have been able to tweak the economy. 
uh, the, the inflation rate in America is at the lowest for a long time. The gas price is at its lowest since before even the war in Ukraine. And so that means somebody somewhere is taking the right decisions. And that's really all we need. We just need the right people taking the right decisions to correct the anomalies in the system. Because there will be anomalies year in, year out, forever. So that's what uh, having the right technocrats and the right political will, that's why it's important. Uh, talking about having the right people in office, it took the president almost six months for us to get uh, a list of people that would be making up our executive council. And then they now showed up. I remember vividly the president said he was looking for men and women who, um, you know, were upright and had no, um, you know, stain or dirt in terms of um, cockroaches or skeletons in their cupboard. But here we are. I, I, I laid that foundation because I'm going somewhere. Um, we have an economic council where the vice president chairs, you know, and we have the minister uh, for finance and several other people that make up that particular council. Um, I would not, I would shudder if you disagree with me on the fact that the people who make up that council are very, very intelligent technocrats and professionals. So is it that they're bereft of ideas or they choose not to implement the ideas that they have? Which is it? Well, um... To start with, waiting for six months to appoint ministers is an indication that if thought was not given to the idea of these ministers before 1-1, one, one, uh, it would give the impression that um, uh, the, the president did not believe he was going to win, and so he was not ready. Normally, your cabinet is ready. They are called the shadow cabinet. They are ready. These are your policy think tanks. They are already talking to you. You already have ideas of what to do when you are in power. You know, they will let you know, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to tackle this one, tackle that one. When they are still uh, inaugurated, so that as soon as you get in, they are good to go, they're ready to move. So that was an error, I believe. And the momentum subsequently was that they were doing catch-up. You know, things had already gone awry before the, the politi political leaders, the technocrats took over. And the, the civil servants were managing the economy. And the civil servants, I'm sorry to say, um, you know, they, they just follow the book. You know, they don't think outside the box most of the time. And so we were just basically tinkering with, let's try this, let's try that, let's try that. And uh, just when we thought the economy was going to stabilize, COVID came, and we couldn't export anything because nobody was buying oil. And then as soon as COVID uh, was, uh, you know, uh, exited, uh, the pandemic uh, exited in, in the world economic scene, then if the inflation came and then the war in Ukraine came. So it now became, you know, running after being reactive rather than proactive because you didn't prepare for all those sort of things. So essentially, uh, not just having agates, just having people with fantastic degrees is never enough. Uh, you must, uh, there's a thing called in, in Greek called katabitsu, which means perfectly prepared. You must always be perfectly prepared for every scenario. A general that goes to war always presumes every situation. You know, if I take this, what will happen? It's like a chess game. If I do this, what will happen? So I have to have plan B, plan C, plan D, and the right people, and I should be able to take action when necessary in order to get the right kind of results. Mm. So I think at the end of the day, um, a leader is expected to take responsibility for the weakness of the team in implementing their ideas and policies. Let's look at Nigeria's debt profile, which is one of the things that, uh, you know, on a normal day would make some of our leaders our heroes past turning their graves. Um, and for want of a better way to describe it, um, a lot of people have compared previous... Well, so this is the thing. In Nigeria, for every time we have bad leadership, we try to praise the leadership before that and say, oh, it wasn't so bad. I think it was better. Uh, and so it makes us continue in that circle of mediocrity. But looking at Nigeria's debt profile right now, and the last amount of money that the president has asked the National Assembly for, and he's also put a caveat that if they do not approve the money in time, there's more interest that's going to accrue on the money. Um, how do we even begin to dig ourselves out of this hole? Because whether we like it or not, it'll take decades to be able to um, you know, wiggle our way out of this one. And, and, and many would also point to the Bassinger administration for some of the debt cancellations uh, that we had under his um, government? Well, um, the fact that um, we do budget deficit in, it's not really, it's not really the, the key problem. I mean, for the size of the economy, what is being borrowed uh, in, in international financial balance is still a manageable uh, percentage of our overall economy. So that's not really the issue. The issue really is where's the money spent? You know, what is the money used for? 
Is it used to really industrialize Nigeria, make us competitive? Are we spending it on education or culture that is going to fit the people or education, uh, vocational education, technical education? Uh, that will ensure that in the next five, ten years, we're going to produce more millionaires. Or are we simply spending it building bridges that cost one billion dollars and things like that that don't have direct impact on the living conditions of the people? So that's really where the problem is when you borrow and then you spend it on things that are not key priorities of the people. And that's because not enough attempt is made to speak to the people about their priorities. You know, a lot of leaders just don't do enough uh, consultation. They don't, they, they just speak to the civil servants and then the policy is out and then money is spent. And then what is the accountable accountability behind this expenditure? So for every one billion, are we sure that you know most of it is spent or is parallel to where you know 20% of it is actually spent for what it's meant for? So if you borrow and America is extremely leveraged, extremely leveraged, the getting ratio is unbelievable. However, whenever they spend money, they spend it in something that in the next two, three months, you will see the impact on the economy. But here we just borrow, but we don't feel the impact. The, Cost of goods are not coming down. The cost of electricity is not coming down. Cost of fuel is not coming down. All the indices that makes a business succeed and therefore the economy succeed, they are still unstable. So you, that's the question. If you keep borrowing and you don't spend it in the right place, you don't get the right results. It's as simple as that. Garbage. Again, um, before we, we move away from that, because I, I, I remember sometime in 20. Uh, 19, if I'm not mistaken, IMF had said that if we are borrowing, then we need to be able to tell what we're borrowing these monies for, uh, for them to be able to make sure that they can get their monies back or these monies are being put to use. So what about accountability? Because we can't have a democracy and then we're not focusing on accountability. Then that means that it's a circus. It's a free for all. Um, how do we ensure accountability going forward? especially for a time like this in Nigeria's life? We don't have, uh, we don't have uh, a viable opposition. Uh, if you look at the American political system and the British political system, you know, it's almost 50-50, you know, 49-48 uh, to 50-51, and such that it forces the government to account to a large opposition in government. And so the, there is a culture of ensuring that when the president is voted into power, it, the chunk of the legislature goes to the opposition so that there is some level of accountability. We don't have that here. What we, what we have is, um, in a way, a, a, another form of dictatorship because whichever party is really the executive, 100% almost always controls the legislature. So nobody's holding anybody to account because at the end of the day, they're going to go back to party meeting and resolve every issue and choose not to ask questions. And so it is a weakness in our democratic system that we need to correct. Uh, the opposition needs to have a voice and they need to speak just like the way I'm speaking right now, without fear of favor, without fear that uh, speaking out means that I will not be able to get decent businesses or they, there's going to be some victimization or the fear. That's why I say that are we in a democracy or a militarocracy? Because if we're in a democracy and it's freedom of speech, as long as I'm not insulting anybody, I should be able to ask anyone who is in power to be accountable. Uh, that is not, and then the press. Who, who should be doing it? Unfortunately, look at the majority of the media. They are owned by politicians, owned by people who are connected to those in power. So they become lobbyists rather than those holding the government to account. So unfortunately, that's the weakness of the system we are in now that we, we, need, to, we need to help these young people, uh, the, this new generation, these emerging leaders that are speaking and screaming and shouting and asking our leaders to be accountable. We need to help them. Finally, let's talk about... Um corruption. Um, it is something that's become endemic. It's eaten so deep into the fabrics of Nigeria's, um, you know, um, system. And we're asking ourselves, how do we make sure that corruption is fought to a standstill, even if it's not completely fought, but at least, you know, plug some of these loopholes? How do we ensure that? Well, the biggest, the biggest strength of, um, the biggest teeth that corruption, that anti-corruption fight has is, um, is holding people to account in the justice system. You know, if you are caught, you should be able to pay for it. And as long as there's no impunity, corruption will go down. But another important thing is being proactive about managing corruption. If you have a civil servant with a de university degree who is earning one-tenth of what a, a degree holder in the banking system and the oil and gas system is earning, you are creating a system that will make that civil servant potentially corruptible. And that's what is happening. When we are underpaying the people managing our economy, their corruption is going to increase. 
They are going to demand kickbacks. They are going to demand bribes. They are going to demand. Well, I'm not. It's not an accusation for all of them, but I'm saying this is the scenario. They're going to expect uh, something from those who are benefiting from the civil servants, and that becomes a culture. So the culture of infinity then means that uh, at the end of the day, you really can't fight corruption because when you try to fight corruption, you go to the legislature. Ten years, you are still in court because there is no will to come to the to the end of that case. The ICPC, the EFCC, all these organizations, they are filled with human beings, some of whom are still not well paid. So they are easily corruptible, you know, by anybody who wants to corrupt them. And what we look for, what we're really looking for now is leadership at every level that has just decided to rise up against the anomalies in the system and say, no, 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 not under my watch. I'm going to change the culture. I'm going to change the way things are. And uh, regardless of what happens to me at the end of the day, my conscience is clear that I've made that job better. There's no other way to fight corruption. There's no other way. Even if you use technology, people will bypass it. If you, if you, any kind of system, with, the policies are there. The policies are there, but it's human beings are, are vulnerable. They're vulnerable. If you're, if you're not, if you need to pay rent of 500,000 next month and you only have 50,000 in your bank account, somebody comes to meet you and says, you know, sign this document for this file, I'll give you 1 million. It's so easy because you don't have a backup. The bank is not going to loan you money averagely in this. This economy, uh, there's no social uh, safety net for the vast majority of people. So it, it's created a corruptible uh, system. That's why I keep saying that investment in entrepreneurship and empowering people is the fastest way because 70% of the economy belongs to the organized, uh, non organized private sector, not the government. So the richer they are, the richer the, com the country is. And the more people they employ, the better the, for, for tax collection. So we need, to, we need to find the right balance between. Um, Fighting corruption as if it's just one kind of entity and the holistic look at the causes of corruption and then make sure that we reduce its impact over the, over the next uh, five, ten years or whoever is coming in next year, this year rather. Well, I want to say thank you so much. George Ashiru is the chairman of the ADC here in Lagos State. Uh, very great conversation that we've had tonight. Um, and we're hoping also that Nigerians will all go get their PVCs so that they can vote and make the right choice. Now, it's time for us to ask ourselves the question, are we the cause of our own misfortune in leadership? I mean, other than the ability to sing and dance to a tune of big promises, our leaders aren't really builders, are they? Because they possess no demonstrable qualification for building good roads or infrastructure or balancing a budget without taking out loans and using our future for collateral. I mean, for all the clever oratory and sweet melodic uh, promises that they pour down the ears of the masses and all the pats on the back that they've given themselves for solving problems that, they have, that have actually grown tentacles, you know, rather than gone away. A pass mark is too generous a grade to give this leadership. But I'm willing to give it to them if it fulfills the old interpretation of barely passing an exam. You know, let my people go. Or in this case, please go and never return. But election day is a promise of a new dawn. Let's do better this time. Go get your PVC and that's my take. I am Mary Anna Cohn. Have a good evening. <laughs>